Hey, business building warrior, welcome back to Silent Sales Machine Radio. I'm your host, Jim Cockrum, and we have a weekend update episode for you. As often as we can, we're going to compile some of the best moments from recent episodes, just in case you missed something, or if you want to be re-reminded of some of the greatest tips and strategies, some of those compelling, maybe emotional moments from some of the recent podcast episodes, some things to really get you fired up and motivated. Maybe you're going to work hard this weekend and knock out some good action on your business. Well, this is a great podcast episode to take with you, our weekend updates. These are short segments, little clips from recent episodes that you may have missed. Now, keep in mind, if you want to hear the full episode for anything you're about to hear, just check the show notes. Go to silentgym.com, find this podcast episode, and look for the show notes. We'll tell you exactly which episode each of our clips were pulled from, so you can go check out the full thing if you'd like. But in any case, thanks for being a listener to this show. Thanks for being a part of the, the growing community of people who enjoy and benefit from the Amazon and e-commerce training that we provide in this community. So one little reminder. All the great people you're going to hear today being interviewed, the discussions I'm having, they all have something in common. They are all students of the Proven Amazon course, the most established, most success-filled, most frequently updated, most cutting-edge Amazon training course that's great for anyone from brand new sellers who have never sold anything before online to some of the most advanced sellers you'll ever meet. They're all using the Proven Amazon course strategies or our coaching program. There's links to both at silentgym.com as well as a link to our free Facebook group where we've got, as I record this, over 71,000 members who are interacting from around the world using the strategies that we teach on this podcast and in our content. So let's jump into the weekend update. Thanks for listening. We'll have brand new episodes for you very soon. So keep listening, keep checking back. Enjoy the weekend update. I am just so impressed with this young lady today. She's a newly single mom. She's carved out several hours per day. She's going all in. She's making this work. And like I said, she's having some initial success. She's finding profitable replens, which as a reminder, that is the system where we've determined 99% of all new Amazon sellers should start with replens. And if you've never heard me talk about it before, maybe I can squeeze in a little introduction of what a replan is. Those are the underserved listings on Amazon, meaning there's a lot of people buying the product. Maybe there's a few sellers selling it, but it's very profitable for the sellers who are selling it. And you can squeeze in alongside those other sellers, sell it for a profit yourself and help serve that listing, help Amazon serve their buying customers by hopping on listings that are underserved. We call those replens, easily sourced products from retail stores near you or maybe online sources. You buy them full retail price the vast majority of the time. And because of the convenience that Amazon sellers expect from the Amazon platform, they're willing to pay more than retail in many, many cases. Millions of listings are this way. We teach you to find them, sell against those listings, and build a beautiful business, in many cases, completely hands-free. But again, today, our guest, Amanda Wicks, is very new. She's only a few weeks in. She's seeing some momentum. And we're going to talk through all of this together, hopefully encourage you, enlighten you, and send you on your way with some new skills today. So if you happen to be or know a single mom, we really do our everything we can to take care of single moms. We see you as cultural heroes. It's not an easy journey that you're on. There's many challenges life can throw at you, of course. But man, I call them the superheroes of our community. Those single moms who are figuring out how to provide for their kids. We talk a little bit about that today too. And we're in your corner. We're here to help you. Let us know how we can help you out. Yeah, 60% ROI. Yeah. What tool are you using to help you calculate? I have Keepa. I have RevSeller. I have Inventory Labs. I also have BQ. I got that. <laughs> for the repricing? Yes, for the repricing. Yeah. Yeah. Be cool. They pronounce it. I be, pronounced be, it be cool yeah. forever. Yeah. <laughs> all these new tools and all this new terminology, you're doing a great job for someone who's only been in it for a short period of time. Thank and, you. You know, a repricer, maybe a tad premature on that. Yeah. 
because unless you're spending a lot of time repricing every day, it's, it's not quite necessary. But that could come within the next, you know, at the pace you're going, the next few weeks or so. It's, but, it's um, helped a lot with my books. Like it's made them kind of fly off the, sh- the shelves. Ah, great yeah. point. Way to teach the teacher. I appreciate that. Okay, so talk me through that a little bit. Have you, you got some books that have been sitting there a while and and bumping them around at the reprice or help them move, huh? Well, yeah, I like I said, I've only been doing it for five weeks, so mm-hmm. there, you know, they haven't had that much time to sit. But I did notice once I got the be be cool, and it, my sales started going a lot faster, and I started selling the books a lot faster. Nice. Um, just because, like. I don't know. I'm. I am really so new. I don't know what the good price is and what a good price is in, and I'm still learning yeah. a lot. I just kind of wanted to send that over there. Yeah, that that's tremendous. That yeah, well done. Okay, let me talk the <laughs> listeners through the tools here, and I may teach you something you don't know already, okay. Amanda. As I talk over the the tools that you've got, but you mentioned Keepa. Mm -hmm. I'll start there. And for those who don't know what that is, go listen to podcast episode 369. Have you heard that episode yet, Amanda, about Keepa? Okay. Very convincing, isn't it? I make a pretty solid argument. And a lot of people, that's the only tool they need. That's it. And and they've built seven-figure businesses with just that tool using the proven Amazon course training. Mm -hmm. Now, the tools that make your life a little easier, and I even like the order that you mentioned them in because it's kind of the order that I would suggest. Rev Seller is next. We've got a great exclusive relationship with those guys. ProvenAmazonCourse.com slash Rev Seller, R-E-V, Rev Seller. That is a tool that puts right on the screen, as you know, Amanda, kind of talking to the listener for a moment, but it puts right on the screen your ROI. So if you're looking at a product on Amazon.com, like you're shopping and it says, hey, this product sells every day for 50 bucks. You're like, okay, well, I can source it for 20. How profitable is it really after all fees and everything? It, it tells you right on the screen, Rev Seller breaks the numbers down for you. Very helpful tool. Inventory Lab, of course, helping you prep your shipments and track your numbers, give you your true net profit margin. A lot of helpful things going on with that tool. Very, very friendly for replen sellers. And then Be Cool, you mentioned as your repricer. We've got a great relationship with those guys as well. Great sponsor of this show, actually. And that's the, that's the repricer I happen to use. Now, on our leadership team of 100 people, you're going to find about six different repricers that are kind of popular. And we could kind of have a debate at any given time. Who likes what? And we've bounced around ourselves. But uh, yeah, Be Cool is a, is a really good group of guys running that. I know them well. And we'll stick a link to all that in the show notes for the listeners. But do you have any questions about any of those tools? You're, you're absorbing a lot of information really quickly. And I got to say kudos to you. I'm very impressed. Well, good for you. And it definitely is possible. And you seem to have the determination and the, the mindset to make it happen. And if our community can help you and serve you in any way, I don't know if you've heard the other episodes where I've had single moms on, but some of the biggest heroes in this community our single moms who have made it work. Have you have you seen my interviews, for example, with Honey Woods yet? Heard that Not name yet? yet? I don't think. No, what no, what episode is that? Uh, we'll stick it in the show notes. I don't know oh. offhand, but okay. she's a single mom with several children. She's actually a leader in our community. She creates oh, wow. content and just does an awesome job. And she actually homeschools a large group of kids too. <laughs> so oh, wow, I think it's, awesome. I mean, I should know it's either five or six kids. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's six. <laughs> it's amazing, right? So draw the inspiration from some of the good people in our community. And there's several of them. Uh, we've had probably over the years, I'd say six or seven episodes with single moms That's that cool. are just have built incredible businesses. Now, this is the first time I've interviewed one who's kind of new to the journey because typically our show format has been success stories, people who are well into the journey, but we're spending some time with yeah. newer students lately by request of the audience, just talking <laughs> through their business, but it can be done. You know, so <laughs> that it definitely can be done. And there's people doing it with arguably busier, more difficult schedules than what you have, although you're in a rough season. So no need to compare stories, but it is possible. Well, any questions about any of the tools that you're using? Do we spend some well, time there? You feel like you're settling in? I did have a question about RevSeller versus yeah. like Keepa. With you know, when you search on Amazon and it, the RevSeller pops up all the information, and it says like it says like 160 drops, but then you scroll down 
on that listing and Keepa will say like 30 drops per mm -hmm. 30 days. Mm -hmm. Like why is the rev seller different than the Keepa? Well, let me back up and lay the foundation to answer that question before I answer it. Okay. Many tools in the Amazon seller universe integrate Keepa data into them. Okay. For reasons that I go into back in podcast episode 369, Keepa is scraping data in ways that nobody else does. So a lot of tools make themselves look very impressive by integrating Keepa data into the tool. Mm -hmm. And RevSeller is impressive on its own even without the Keepa data because of the things it does. But it also does integrate some Keepa data. And if I recall, when you're looking at RevSeller, you can set an option for a 30, 60 or 90 day view of the rev of the uh, keepa data so you may be looking at 90 days worth of data instead of 30 so on keepa you're looking at 30 days worth of drops on rev you may be looking at 90 days okay that makes sense yeah and if that's not the case if for some reason rev seller is grabbing wrong data i don't use that part of rev seller anyway okay. i look at keepa <laughs> okay keepa is the tool go by what keepa says and Got as you it. go through the proven Amazon course training, you may have seen this, Amanda, but it's just a good reminder that if Keepa says that there are, say, 12 to 15 drops per month on any given ASIN, mm -hmm. rank changes. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, please go listen to podcast episode 369. We talk you through it. But if it says 12 to 15 drops, that's pretty accurate, typically, fairly accurate. Not all the time. Sometimes it's too low. Okay. But it's typically pretty accurate. If you get up over 15, 20, say you see 25, 30, 40 drops per month on Keepa, you can very safely triple or quadruple that number to get the actual number of sales per month of that ASIN. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yep. Because if you, if you think about it, Keepa's checking in every few hours or every several hours or once a day. There could have been multiple sales if something, if it thinks something's... Rank changes once a day. Well, it could be changing multiple times and keep it just only checks in once a day to report the change. Okay. Right. Whereas if there's only a few drops per month, keep is pretty likely to capture those checking in once or so a day or once yeah, every several makes hours. Sense. Make sense? Yep. So a lot of times, if you see a rank of anything over 25 or 30, it's like, okay, let's say it's 25. We know pretty safe that thing could be selling up to a couple hundred or even 400 times a month with that level of rank, just as a okay. tip. Okay. Yeah, very good. Sounds like you're settling in though to, uh, yeah. to using the tools and trusting the data and making good decisions when you're looking at your history on Keepa. Are you looking way back, like a year or so? Uh, no, I've kind of just been doing the three months yeah, I, I would encourage you look back a little further than that. You can see some okay. interesting trends. The three month window tells yeah. you a lot. That one year window could tell you even more. It can tell okay. you is this thing a seasonal, for example? Or is it like really spike right before Christmas and then die? And spike <laughs> before Christmas and die. That's a seasonal. Okay. Uh, as far as the yeah. number of drops, you know, and actually when it when it spikes, that means it's it's you're actually seeing the line can, goes down because the rank is dropping. It's moving closer to being in that number one position. So you see the line kind of move down. And then you can tell a lot by looking at the number of sellers too. If uh, the number of sellers goes from 10 and then down to one and then up to 12 and then down to one and then up to three or four and then it's one again for a while. That tells you, for example, that the brand owner doesn't like other sellers selling that product and they're aggressively trying to kick them off. And it's probably not worth your time to mess with it because I'll try to kick you off too. Okay. It's bouncing down to just one seller. Right? And these, these are all little lessons you're going to pick up in the training. You don't have to know all of these things to find great ASINs. You've <laughs> already found some just with the knowledge you have, but uh, they really are everywhere. Yeah. As okay. you've experienced, just looking at... I love it. You just started with Target and Walmart. Yeah. Yep. Very good. You're kind of at the stage now where I think you're going to start finding yourself being able to get ungated in brands and you can get off the beaten path a little bit is one of the things I'd like to encourage you to do. Okay. For what I mean by that is if you have stores in your area, local stores that are maybe more regional, they're not all over the United States. Because Target and Walmart, yes, there are beautiful replans to be found there. 
But if it's fairly easy for other people to find it, the odds of someone coming in and or, or a wave of sellers coming in or that product ending up on some kind of buy list from somewhere, I've got this fly that's pestering me. Uh, <laughs> your odds go up of a buy list encounter where suddenly there's 30 sellers on this great replan you found. And that can be frustrating. Okay. And you, you're still, it, as long as you're finding new replans, this model works beautifully, but you just have to kind of be ready to be unemotionally attached to every replan because they'll come and they'll go. Sometimes they'll last a few weeks, sometimes they'll last several months. You'll have replans. We have some that have been around for a few years, it's very profitable. Typically, those ones that stick around for several months or even years are the ones that are kind of off the beaten path, meaning it's a specialty store of some kind. You've gone into, say, an ethnic store and you've taken some pictures of the store shelves with the owner's permission. Tell them why you're there. Hey, I want to buy some stuff from you to sell on Amazon. I'm doing some product research. Can I take a few pictures? And we've only heard one encounter in this community where the owner said, no, I don't want you in here taking pictures. <laughs> like, okay. And you just <laughs> learn to take no and you move on. That's okay. Yep. Um, but the vast majority of the time, they're perfectly fine to say, I'm looking for inventory. I want to buy it from you or maybe a case at a time even. And and you know, so 12 units at a time or 15 units at a time. And can I take some pictures, do some research, maybe even take some pictures of your catalog and place some orders with you that way, which we've done. Now you go home and you're a little, you're a little off the beaten path of what others are seeing every day going through a Walmart or a Target or you know, some of the other national change. But the thing I can tell you is regionally, even within the same city, you're going to see different products on the shelves at different Walmarts at different prices even. So there's a lot of room there for great products. And we've got a large list of Walmart replens that we source consistently. And Kroger, same way. Target, same way. There's some universally great replens that even have numerous sellers, but it's still a great replen. That's what I was um, thinking of. Like I know Trader Joe's is still pretty much pretty popular, but it's really popular here where I'm at. So I was like, Mm -hmm. oh, well, I could source there too. Yeah. The thing with Trader Joe's is they are kind of the ultimate example of a retailer that does not like resellers. But (laughs) but I'm of the opinion, we don't have to go down the philosophical reasons why. If I buy something from somebody, I don't care what their opinion is about me reselling it. I own it now. (laughs) <laughs> and yeah, as long yeah. as I'm not selling it on a platform that doesn't allow me to sell it, like if Amazon had a rule that says, you can't sell hot sauce here. Well, I'm not going to go try to sell hot sauce on their platform. I'll sell it somewhere yeah. else. But Amazon doesn't have a rule against selling Trader Joe's products. Trader Joe has a rule about, I can't buy their stuff and sell it to someone else. Philosophically, I completely disagree with that rule. There's no moral authority there to tell me that once I own something... I can't sell it to somebody else. Now, if there's a law preventing me from doing it, I'm not going to break a law, obviously. There's no law against it. It's more of Trader Joe's opinion on the matter happens to be. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) imagine going to a yard sale and the person selling the stuff in their driveway has a sign that says, hey, it's okay to buy the things that you see here, but you better not sell them to somebody else later. Like, what? (laughs) That doesn't make any sense. No. So, So, you know, once you've figured that out, You know, there's no Trader Joe's conveniently located near me. If I'm a fan of Trader Joe hot sauce, I've got no option but to get online and find somebody who's gone in and spent some time, effort, energy, prepping, packaging, making sure it arrived to me safely on time. Yeah, that's worth a few bucks for sure to jump in. That's (laughs) That's my thought process on that. But if you try to clear the shelf of 50 units of something, <laughs> they're gonna, you might have a talk with a manager on your way out the door. It's like, uh, do you really like this or what's going on here? Uh, and, and I always encourage relationships. There's never any reason to be dishonest in this business. There's so many opportunities to provide value and build relationships and straight up oh. tell people, yeah, I, I'm a reseller online. I would love to place some large orders. All right. But with Trader Joe's, you may not get the friendliest response. Some of them I've heard are great. Same with Target stores. Some are just yeah. great. I've talked to the owner, sorry, the manager at our Target store. Actually, here's a story for you. This is the Target, the one located nearest me, the one that we go to all the time. They had a huge rack of, it was the end, it was about now, it was about this time of year. We're coming up on fall and they were getting rid of a lot of their summer swimming stuff. And they had this huge wall of kids swim uh, life jackets, like the vest zip up life jackets. Yeah. And they were 70% off. And they had maybe, I don't know, 40 or 50 of them. 
And I said to the manager, hey, if I bought all of these, could you give me a discount? And the manager said, are you a reseller? And I said, yes. He said, we don't sell to resellers. No, the price is the price. And we don't like selling to resellers. Okay. <laughs> Came back the next day with my daughter. I don't know if that made a difference. This is several years ago. So she's, you know, little pumpkin in the front seat and of, the, of the cart, you know, as I'm pushing her along. And I'm standing there and a different manager is there. And I said, same exact question to the different manager. And I said, hey, I noticed these are all 70% off. If I clear this shelf for you guys, what can you do for me? And he said, how about an extra 10% off? I'd love to clear this right now. That'd be great. Oh, wow. <laughs> different manager, different day, different mood. Same question, same scenario. Never right? know. So sometimes we get we, we overthink and we get intimidated and we think, oh, the system doesn't like me out here doing... And we sold them for a great profit, by the way. I mean, I bought them all and sold them all. Nice. Uh, yeah. But sometimes we get intimidated thinking, well, that store has a reputation for being... No, it's it's the people at the store. You build yeah. a relationship, you're nice, you smile, you, you leave things better than you found them, you put your cart back, you know, you're know, you friendly with the re- people at the register. There's yeah. people I'll see at registers when I... And I don't do so much retail shopping myself these days, but I used to when I'd see certain people, I'd be like, hey, what's your candy bar today? And they just know I'm going to buy them a candy bar every time I'm there. Oh. And I'm going to p- pay for it as part of what I'm doing. Check it. It's a business expense. I'm building relationships. I just throw it in the order with everything else, but I leave it for the, you know, for the person at the register. And oh. lo and behold, that person, you know, is there being very, very helpful next time I'm there, right? <laughs> just that little gesture because they're used to dealing with rude people all day. Yep. But you're the candy bar guy. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we'll get back to the show in just a second, but I've got to tell you about a great sponsor who's just joined us. I'm talking about Seller Board. This is a very popular service used by many Amazon sellers in our community because they understand how important it is, how crucial it is to know your numbers. How do you know how profitable you are? All those fees, the different expenses, the cost of goods sold, how do you track it all? Seller Board is phenomenal. Starting as low as just $15 a month with a two-month trial on top of that. You really need to check these guys out. Get over to silentgym.com slash numbers. Again, silentgym.com slash numbers. It's time to know your numbers. It's an accurate profit analytics software tool just for Amazon sellers. They've been doing this since 2017. It is a really cool tool doing some things that I'm unaware of anyone else doing. So the pricing starts at $15. Like I said, get your two-month trial at silentgym.com slash numbers. I think one of the episodes that you might really enjoy listening to, Amanda, if you haven't heard it yet, it's back in the early 20s of this podcast. It was... um, you know, we're in episode 500 something plus at this point. But you go back to episode, I think it was like 24, 25, 26, somewhere in there. It's okay. the ethics of buying low and selling high. And the reason that's an important lesson for us all to take to heart, I want to talk about the scenario you just gave me, but it's a very, it's a vital lesson because if we don't see the virtuous nature of the activity we're engaged in, we tend to self-sabotage and undermine what it is that we're doing. We're all familiar with self-sabotage. You know what I mean by that, right? Putting your keys somewhere where you won't find them the next day. <laughs> and you're like, why did I do that? Like, what, what am I thinking? I'm just setting myself up for failure. Why did I put the keys in the refrigerator? <laughs> what happened? Right, so there's little things we do to kind of self-sabotage because we don't see how virtuous our activity is. So here's, uh, that's why I recorded that podcast episode. And let's go revisit the scenario where you're buying all these books. Yeah. You are doing that business a huge favor, just buying product at the price that they've already put on it. You owe them nothing else. You're doing them a huge favor. You're clearing inventory, the velocity of their inventory, clearing shelf space so other things can go there. They've put a price that they like. You know, that's the beauty of the free market. Yeah. So one of the things I like to say all the time is it's impossible to run a profitable business without dramatically and positively impacting the lives of countless others. It's impossible. So just a transaction at the agreed upon price with no other arrangements being made is a win, not just for you and the person selling you the item, but for countless other people on either side of that transaction. Mm -hmm. And understanding that is vital because now you're not just supporting your family, which is a beautiful thing. That's a very virtuous thing. 
it goes way beyond that. The people who, let's just take this bookshop where you're buying the books, right? They have to pay rent. Somebody owns that building. Someone took a risk and bought that building and now they're paying rent and taxes and they're trying to keep it going. That's how they support their family. They lease property. You've got the people who work at the electric plant whose families rely on people paying their electric bills. You know, you've got all the people that service and deliver to that business, all the employees that work there. You're part of supporting all of that. And then you got the people buying the book and the experience they're going to have, reading it to their kid, adding to their collection. That's how we create value. Entrepreneurs create value. That's what we do on both sides of the transaction. So you sit down and really think, impacting countless lives positively by just running a profitable business. And you've got to internalize that because if you don't, again, the downside is if you don't and you think, well, I'm just a terrible person turning $5 bills into $10 bills. I'm not doing anything for anybody. You're going to self-sabotage, burn out, and it's not going to work out long term. Does that make sense? Yeah, that actually does make sense. And I've been struggling with that a little bit lately. So that's really helpful. Good. Go back and listen to that episode. I'd be very curious to hear what you think okay. of it. And and uh, I think I make a pretty compelling case. And yeah. it's not just me. You know, our, the whole concept of free markets, which revolutionized the economies of... You lifted the world out of poverty, basically. Yeah. Free markets. It's that concept. It's people freely exchanging based on an honest system of, you know, hey, I give you this, you give me that. We both won. It's a biblical concept. Two winners. Every transaction has two winners in a free market. And then multiple winners on either side of those two winners. Yep. Beautiful thing when you start to understand that. So then you can be very excited and go in and you're not saying, hey, how can I give you part of the profits? You're saying, hey, can I get it a discount? I'm clearing a bunch of shelf. I'm helping you out. And he's like, well, I can't do a discount today. But I'll tell you, if you get 500 bucks next time, I'll, I'll knock 10% off for you. Okay, we'll see you next time. You're building a relationship. <laughs> That's what a transaction is the start of a beautiful, mutually beneficial relationship. Well done. I wrote notes. <laughs> hey, let's uh, go through them. Great. <laughs> okay. So th- some of these questions may seem immature because I just don't know that much yet. But um, I was wondering, I ran into a couple of problems where, especially with like the school, when school started, there was a lot of school supply sales that I would buy. But then I realized that Amazon's listing, like the picture, the title was the same, but the picture was different. Mm. And I was curious. I'm like, I don't, not like I didn't want to risk sending it in and then um, getting in trouble for the picture not being exactly what somebody ordered, or, you know, the the item not being exactly what the picture looked like. Yep. But I was wondering, is that a normal thing? Is mm-hmm. like, okay. That, that I'll is... talk you through it. I'll talk you okay. through it. <laughs> there, there is a little thin gray area here, but most new sellers have the gray area in their mind way bigger than it needs to be on this exact topic. So the scenario okay. you're giving me is the picture looks a little different. The title's the same. I'm going to assume maybe even the barcode is the same if there's a barcode. Yeah. Okay, there's a yeah. lot of things common here, but man, it just looks a little different. Here's where you kind of have to use your best judgment and think to yourself, if I'm the buying customer, am I going to complain? Okay. And the more cautious you want to be, you think, okay, if I'm 50 buying customers, how likely is it that one or two of those people might complain? Having seen this picture and then received this product, is it going to generate a complaint? And a good tip is look down in the feedback that that listing has received. If you have a whole bunch of people saying, hey, this thing's supposed to be red, according to the picture, and it showed up green, this is not the same product. If you've got unhappy customers, that's what gets Amazon paying attention to that listing and saying, nope, can't do it anymore. Your worst case scenario is 99% of the time, this is true. Your worst case scenario is Amazon says, hey, this product doesn't match the listing anymore. We're shutting down this ASIN. We're sending you back your product. That's the worst case. So as a replin seller, if you've only got a few at a time that you're in there, that's the model, right? A few at a time. Yeah. No big deal. Flip them on eBay, flip them on Facebook Marketplace, right? Pass them out to the neighborhood kids for Christmas, right? (laughs) So that's the reality of it. But if you run it through that filter of, You know, because one of the things that we'll see a lot, we do this a lot. Like, let's say we've got a 60 ounce cleaning product and 
same barcode, same cleaning product, same number of ounces, exact same ingredients, except the it used to be a let's say a bright blue bottle and now it's kind of a dark blue bottle and the and the writing's just a little different on the logo. Yeah. Yeah, we'll sell it anyway until okay. someone tells us we can't. That's okay. us. Some people would say, "Oh no, no, no. Super cautious. Identical exact match only." But it's a risk worth taking from my vantage point. Uh, especially it makes us a little more exclusive of a seller on that ASIN sometimes because people go, oh, well, the bottle's changed. We're not going to sell it anymore. Well, we dig a little deeper, go, okay, same barcode, same ingredients, same product. What reasonable customer would actually ever complain about the logo tilting a little to the right and the font's (laughs) changed? Like, I don't think a customer is going to complain about that. No. And here we are a few years into selling some products just like that. And and people typically don't complain. But if it generates a few customer complaints, then it's time to pull the trigger and and, bail on that one. Does that help? Yes, that helps a lot. So there is a gray area there, but it's a thin gray area. It's not this wide, scary gray area that a lot of new sellers tend to imagine it is. I also had my first uh, policy violation, but it was for... It was for pricing. It said that they sent me a message saying that my pricing was too high and they removed my my product from the listing um, unless I lowered my pricing. But like there was like FBA on there that were higher than even my pricing. So I was really like confused about that. Is that normal? <laughs> yes. Amazon as a company is unfortunately very confused about Price policy. It, it, the confusion is built into the algorithm. <laughs> Let's say it that way. If you wanted to see some craziness back at the beginning of COVID, for example, you could find tens of thousands of listings where what I'm about to say was true. Here's Amazon at high price X. Let's say twenty bucks. Here's the next highest seller selling the exact same product for say fifteen dollars, getting price alert warnings saying that they're selling it for too much. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then here's other sellers selling it at a loss and they're fine. But oh, Amazon is selling it every day for 20 bucks. And it, it was, it's because they're very, you think about Amazon from Amazon's perspective for just a moment. And there's going, you know, there's going to be mistakes in the system. And I'll tell yeah. you what to do about it in a moment. But a lot of times they will hold us to impossible standards as third party sellers. And the only thing you can do is, bump down into whatever it is they're asking you to do and start to bump yourself up. But Amazon is very cautious about being perceived as a platform where that you can go get a deal. They're even running TV commercials that I've seen. Like, hey, Amazon's where you go to get a great deal, get a steal, you know, get a get the best price. So if there's hard to find, they don't like the law of supply and demand kicking in when a product's a little harder to find and there's only a few sellers selling it and the price starts to creep up, Amazon can sometimes get in there and get a little grumpy. It's not a frequent enough problem that it causes major issues because you just drop your price down and then slowly lower it over time. And if you can't sell it at a profitable margin, it's no longer a good replan. One of the examples I like to give Amanda is, let's say there's a three pack of green beans And you can get them for a dollar each. So $3 at Walmart. Well, for Amazon to sell those same three pack of green beans on their website for $3, it costs a lot more money for them to to ship it, store it, ship it to a customer, right? Deliver to your porch. Like it takes a lot of money. So Amazon may use that as a loss leader for a while and deliver those three cans of green beans for $3, just like Walmart. And when I say loss leader, I mean, they get people in the front door, right? Do you know what I mean by a loss leader? No. Have you heard no. that phrase? So every no. grocery store does this. This is good for you to understand as a seller. Every grocery store you'll ever go into has loss leaders. And those are products that they sell intentionally at a loss just to get people in the door. Okay. That makes sense? A loss yeah. leader. It leads yeah. people through the store to the back. You know, the milk is typically sold break even. So you yeah. go all the way through the store to the back to get that stuff that's being sold at break even, very competitively priced. But then you got to make your way all the way back through the store and you're grabbing the Twinkies and the Ho-Hos and the chips <laughs> and the, right? I mean, where they're making their money now. Yeah. So that's Amazon does the same thing. There's a lot of products that are very competitively priced that Amazon has gone out and bought 10,000 units of it. But after a while, Amazon sometimes will grow tired of selling that product at a loss 
And the, the third party sellers kind of come in and we're saying, hey, that, that three pack, yeah, I can go buy this for three bucks at Walmart, but that price is going to creep up to nine, 12, 15 bucks on that three pack. And out of convenience, many buyers continue to buy it. They're not price shopping. They're not comparing. They're not clipping coupons. They're saying, I got to make a green bean casserole in two hours. There's the beans, 12 bucks. I don't care. I don't have time to go to Walmart. Send them to my front porch right now, Amazon. And that's a third party seller who stepped in. That's the role we play is once Amazon's done treating it like it's a loss leader, the third party sellers can step in at a profit and continue to meet the demand on that ASIN. If customers don't want to pay that amount of money, well, the ASIN dies. Or if Amazon says, whoa, 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 you can't charge more than $3 for these three cans of green beans. The ASIN dies then too, because nobody can afford to drive to Walmart as a reseller, buy three cans of green beans, bring it home, pack it up, send it into the warehouse, pay all the Amazon fees and make a profit for three bucks. So that ASIN dies unless Amazon's willing to sell it. Okay. So the customers and the demand, that's economics 101. Supply and demand sets the price. So as long as Amazon stays out of the way, supply and demand sets the price. Sometimes Amazon inserts itself. And on that particular listing that you're talking about, they inserted themselves and said, hey, here's the price cap on this. Nothing higher than this. Sometimes they mean it. Quite often they don't. Meaning if you drop onto that line and then slowly creep back over that line, they're going to be just fine with it. It's all algorithm based. And if Amazon really comes down hard on one and says, hey, no, you can't sell this at a profit, you stop selling it. It's that simple. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Does that yeah. help? Yes, a lot. <laughs> I give long explanations. It's because I'm trying to talk t- through every possible eventuality. So when you go back and listen to this or someone else is listening to it, <laughs> hopefully I'm covering a lot of bases. Because I could have just said, hey, drop your price, raise it again, you'll be fine. But I, I wanted to go into more why that happens and how it's kind of built into the system. Uh, it's it almost gives, an unavoidable thing. It, but it, the way that you explain it gives a lot of comfortability to the situation because then I can understand what's actually happening, not just what I need to do to fix it. I follow the Facebook group and just to like, I like hearing what other people are like going through and um, stuff like that. And sure. I've heard a lot about IP complaints and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't understand what is IP complaint and it seems to be like a normal thing in the reseller's life. Yeah, it is. It's one of those problems. It's an inconvenience at worst. Okay. Okay, So again, I'm going to talk you through kind of the whole bell curve of experiences here, the whole gamut. Over here on the far extreme edge of the story, very few people ever experience this, but it's worth mentioning is people who over the course of, I'll say it this way, over the course of having taught thousands of people how to run businesses on Amazon over the past 12 years, I'm aware of fewer than five people who have been permanently suspended based on going through our training and our coaching and us helping them. Now there's temporary suspensions. Those happen sometimes and people get their account back and it's all good. That's over 95% of the time if someone gets suspended, it's a few days, maybe a few weeks at the worst, they're back up in action, fix whatever the problem was. Of those five people who are permanently suspended, a couple of them ignored multiple IP complaints and did nothing about them. What's an IP complaint? Intellectual property. Let's say that I start selling a widget on Amazon and I'm the product brand owner. It's got my name on it and I don't want anyone else selling it. So I brand registered it and I've gone through all the steps of protecting it. And along comes somebody who found 15 of them on sale at a yard sale, new in the box, and they want to sell them on that same listing. I could either be okay with it or I could make their life miserable because I'm the brand owner and I don't want you selling my product. I want to protect the customer experience. How do I know that they're not going to receive that product with a dented corner, right? Like I I don't want you reselling it. Good news is somewhere around 80% of all brands could care less on 90% of the products on Amazon. But you will have brands who are very grumpy and don't want you there. The best way to avoid this issue is to watch the Keepa data. And like I talked to you about earlier, if you're noticing several sellers are selling a product, 10, 15 sellers, and then suddenly it drops down to one seller. And it creeps back up to three or four sellers and then back down to one seller. And you look at that one seller's name, which you can see right on Amazon. And it's, you know, let's say it's a littlewhitewidgets.com. And this is a little white widget. Like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to go up against littlewhitewidgets.com and try to sell their little white widget. They don't like sellers. 
So you resellers. So you avoid that ASIN. You don't sell it, no matter how profitable it is. Maybe you flip them on eBay or something. Okay. So avoiding IP complaints is a great rule of thumb. And we spend a significant amount of time in the Proven Amazon course teaching you how to completely avoid them. Good news is there's big sellers. I'm talking, you know, multiple seven figure sellers doing this business model who deal with a good number of IP complaints every single week where a brand comes along and says, Hey, you've been selling this product profitably for a while, but I think we're done with that now. We don't like the way that you're representing our brand. They complain to Amazon. A lot of times when they complain to Amazon, Amazon says right back, Sorry, there's nothing we can do. That's a comp- completely legal reseller. You haven't even brand registered your brand with us. We can't help you. Third party sellers keep doing what they're doing. Quite often, though, it is a registered brand. You are asked to get off. There's a complaint. It'll stay on your account for 60 days or you know 180 days, I think, this little complaint. And then it just kind of vanishes and goes away. Sometimes they'll ask you for what's called a plan of action. Like, hey, what are you going to do to prevent? ever in the future, selling littlewhitewidgets.com. And you'll write them a little letter and it says, well, I bought a few. I learned my lesson. I will never sell on this ASIN again. Here's my receipt proving that it was a legitimate purchase. But I'm done with that ASIN. I've removed it. And they'll go, okay, that's fine. And that IP complaint will go away over time. 99% of the time, it is an inconvenience. That's the short answer. Okay. But you don't want to ignore it. It's kind of like going to the dentist as part of having teeth. <laughs> yeah. Not fun to talk about. Nobody wants to know when he looks forward to it. It's kind of part of having a decent smile though is brushing your teeth and going to a dentist every once in a while. Okay. And if you do absolutely nothing and ignore it your whole life and never brush, well, yeah, you're going to have some problems. (laughs) It's kind of like (laughs) that. I've never made that analogy before, but I think it kind of works. (laughs) With a little daily maintenance, a little paying attention to your account health, occasional trip to the dentist, that's like the equivalent of writing a plan of action when they ask for it. Scott Magulius has a book. He's a great member in our community. The title is Plan of Action, Plans of Action, something like that, Scott Magulius. I'll stick it in the show notes too. But if you ever run into this situation where Amazon's saying, hey, we need you to write up a plan of action so that this doesn't happen again, you're like, what? What are you asking me for right now? That book steps you through, has templates and and, uh, how to handle that scenario. And we've got another great guy in our community. He spoke at our event here recently, Jeff Schick, S-C-H-I-C-K, Jeff Schick. He's a lawyer. He's got great contacts at Amazon and he knows how to help sellers with tough situations if you do start to get into like, you know, any of the scarier scenarios. But he works with resellers all the time, has a a great reputation and he'll tell you the same numbers I just told you. Don't be intimidated by this stuff. Yeah, sometimes you have to send in some paperwork. It's part of it, unfortunately. So... There you go. The first time you see an IP complaint, everybody panics and freaks out because they word it in such a scary way. It's kind of like getting a letter from the IRS. Uh, It's like, hey, you owe us a certain amount of money. And if you don't send it to us, we're going to take everything you've ever owned in your whole life and your kids and everything you ever think about owning in the future. Like, well, what's really behind this? Oh, we just need $18. (laughs) Like, okay, here's the $18, please. Like, leave me alone now. Yep, yep, we're good. It's like, you know, just scary worded letter, but all bark, no bite is really, that's the story behind IP complaints 99% of the time. That's good to know. Yeah. Hopefully that's helpful to you. And this is again, with thousands of students going through our courses content and and posting very openly in our groups about the things they're seeing and going through. So there for a while, it was more serious. They had us a little more nervous than they have us now. It's actually gotten a lot friendlier now than it was say four or five years ago. Oh, nice. Okay. I don't think I would have been able to do it without you guys' course. It it lays it out really well and simple for me. <laughs> oh, good. That's great to hear. Well, I'm glad you're stepping through it. Yeah, and it's going to open up all kinds of doors for you. It really will. This initial success will lead to other opportunities on Amazon and off. Yeah. It's biz- building a business is a leadership journey that you've started. And I think you're feeling a little bit of that. It's it's stretching you in ways that maybe you haven't stretched yourself in a while. And that part of you that's getting stronger is going to be capable of some really fun, interesting, cool things as you continue this journey that, that could dwarf the success that you have on Amazon. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. It's, it's a skill that I kind of want to stretch. I'm not used to any of it, but it's 
I, it, I, I'm saying that it's going to like open the door to making my dreams come true because I eventually, my ultimate goal is to foster. I want to foster lots of teenage kids. Um, um, that's so beautiful. This is, I'm really like, this is a big deal for me because I'm hoping this will give me the tools and resources to be able to do that. Brilliant. I can't do it right now, but eventually I'm going to be able to do it. Yes. What a great other oriented goal for you to have. That's fantastic. Yeah. I think just hearing you say that, there's a whole lot of people rooting for you, cheering for you. I mean, we already love single moms and we support them and do our best to encourage them in the battle and the struggle that they have. I'm amazed by that. But the fact that you've got an other oriented goal on the horizon wanting to foster. Why teens? I'm curious. Talk me through that if you don't mind sharing that vision. Just to put it into words, I think even helps solidify it in our minds sometimes, right? <laughs> uh, teenagers, I kind of, I've always been drawn to just foster teenagers because I technically wasn't a foster teenager, but I was, I should have been. <laughs> mm. To simply put it, I, I was yeah. out there and I, I really needed a lot of help when I was a teenager. Yeah. And I want to be there for other teenagers. So it's a special, a special spot in my heart, that stage in life where you're, you're out of your parents and you're entering the big mm -hmm. world, the real world. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of tools and skills that, you know, it's just helpful to know. And I want to be that transitioning for them. I want to help them out and give them a boost and a fresh start and a good start to life. Like what a beautiful vision and stated very eloquently. It's obvious you've, you've thought this over quite yes. a bit. <laughs> we have some beautiful foster families in our community. Uh, I'm thinking of one of the coaches in UK, Neil Stevens and, and his wife. Uh, they actually made it over to our, our live event in Louisville here a few weeks ago. But they've fostered multiple kids. I don't remember how many. It's a ridiculous number. Just the most giving, humble, kind-hearted people that have just poured into... So you might look up Neil Stevens and, and okay. then, uh, you know, we've, we've got several others in our community, just great coaches on our team who have fostered and others, and, you know, the, our family's big advocates of adoption. We've internationally adopted three times. So oh, we understand nice. that journey of kind of opening up the love of your family to, to others. And it's how big of a blessing that ultimately is for you as well. Yes. Yeah. Very familiar with that. Yep. Uh, what a great vision. God bless you on that, Amanda. That's Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Well, let's make it happen. What do you say? Yes. <laughs> let's do it. Yes. Yeah. You're more than capable. You're in the right community. There's a saying I heard a few years ago, you'll hear it bounced around from time to time in our community now is you can find your purpose once you've found your people. Yeah. I love that. And I hope that we can be part of your people that you need. Now you got to have local friends and people supporting you too, but this virtual community yeah, you're going to feel the love. And I would just encourage folks, you know, send Amanda a little note, a little comment that even if you're watching this on YouTube or if you send us a note, we'll make sure and forward it to her of encouraging her on her journey. Uh, you're, going to, you're going to get a lot of love from this community for what it is you're trying to do. We're here for you. Thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, I appreciate your heart. Hey, thanks for listening today. Before I let you go, one last announcement. I want to remind you about our great sponsor, Sellerboard. Get to silentgym.com slash numbers and you'll see the special offer they have for you. Starting at just $15 per month, you can get the most accurate tracking, the best analytics tool for your Amazon seller account. And not only does it help you track your numbers and know when you're profitable or not on each ASIN, it also gives you additional features such as managing your inventory, getting reimbursements for FBA errors, staying informed about listing changes, and optimizing your pay-per-click campaigns. A bunch of robust features for just a few dollars. It's a great tool. Many successful sellers in our community are using them, especially loving the way that they help you know if you're profitable or not, keeping track of all those different fees. Hey, go check out Sellerboard, silentgym.com slash numbers. We'll talk to you next time. <laughs>